Hi, good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Hugh Thomas. I'm the director uh, of the Center for the Humanities at the University of Miami. And uh, it's our, my great pleasure to welcome you to the second of our virtual Stanford talks uh, this year. I'll start with an introduction before turning it, uh, starting with mentioning some uh, future events before turning it over to uh, the introducer of our speaker. Um, we're winding down the semester, but we do have two faculty book talks coming up uh, on Wednesday, November 18th at 8. Uh, Melvin Butler from the School of Music will be talking about his book, Island Gospel, Pentecostal Music and Identity in Jamaica and the United States. And then on Wednesday, December 9th at 8, uh, Mark Rollins in the philosophy department will be talking about his book, Can Animals Be Persons? Uh, we'll be posting a uh, link for our calendar in the chat, uh, and we'll also be posting a link for this evening's book. Uh, one last bit of business. Uh, we'll be having the talk and entertaining questions at the end. If you'd like to uh, ask a question, uh, you can go down, uh, hover at the bottom of your screen, click on Q&A, and type it in. Uh, feel free to type it in at any point in the talk. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll be handling the questions at the end, as I said. And with that, I'd like it to turn it over to my colleague in the history department, Professor Astley White, who will be introducing Mary Beth Norton, our speaker this evening. I am honored to introduce Mary Beth Norton, Mary Donlan Alger Professor Emerita in the Department of History at Cornell University. Professor Norton is one of the most prominent historians of early North America, whose impressive scholarship has had an enormous influence on our understanding of the era. Professor Norton is the author of six books that have recast the field in two significant yet slightly different ways. Norton is a master in restoring the perspectives of overlooked actors to the core narratives of early American history. Her first book considers the American Revolution from the view of loyalists exiled in England, exploring in a nuanced and balanced account their motivations and experiences. Her most ambitious project of historical recovery, however, has involved the history of women. In a trilogy of works, Liberty's Daughters, Founding Mothers and Fathers, and Separated by Their Sex, she examines the lives and impact of women in British North America from colonization through independence. Taken together, these books reveal the contributions of women and gender to key aspects of the era, from ideology and social formation to the American Revolution and the Constitution. The persuasive force of her arguments resonated throughout the field and beyond as evidenced by the fact that one of the books in this trilogy, Founding Mothers and Fathers, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. While Professor Norton is particularly adept at the hard work of historical recovery, she also boldly tackles seemingly exhausted topics and breathes new life into them. In her book, In the Devil's Snare, she reconsiders the Salem witch trials, an endeavor which is not for the faint of heart. And in her latest book, about which we'll learn more tonight, she takes on the American Revolution, making the case for the crucial importance of the year 1774. Thanks to her meticulous research, thoughtful questioning, and narrative verve, Norton revises what we thought we knew about these seminal events and moments. Not surprisingly, Professor Norton has been the recipient of numerous accolades. She has served on the National Council of the Humanities. She was the president of the American Historical Association, and she is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Philosophical Society. I'm gonna stop there with the list, but as you can probably guess, it goes on for a while. For all her individual achievements, Professor Norton is also a collaborator. She is the co-editor of several well-received volumes and a co-author of a popular U.S. history textbook, A People and a Nation. Finally, by all accounts, Professor Norton is a dedicated mentor to undergraduate and graduate students and to numerous colleagues. We are very fortunate to have Professor Norton join us this evening, especially under these less than ideal conditions. 
please give your warmest virtual welcome to Professor Mary Beth Norton. Thanks very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I will say that when I, I'll just say briefly that when I decided to write about Salem witchcraft, my friend said the equivalent of, are you crazy? <laughs> and do you think you can find anything new? I said I thought I could, even though what I found that was new was not what I thought I was gonna find, but in any event, I did find it. So in this case, in thinking about 1774, as I say in the introduction to the book, I've actually been thinking about this book or the possibility of this book since 1972, since I finished my doctoral dissertation and published it in the book on the Loyalists. Um, my interest in the year 1774 very much developed during my work on, um, on the Loyalists. Uh, and it was because I realized that 1774 was absolutely crucial in the run up to the revolution but yet it had been commonly, the events of that year and the political discourse of that year, which is really my focus, um, had, been, um, ha had been commonly overlooked. Um, I call the book The Long Year of Revolution because um, I start the book in October of 1773 when the colonists first learned that tea ships were coming to North America and I end it uh, just before the battles of Lexington and Concord. So it's actually a year, more or less 16 months long. Historians um, commonly talk about things like the long 18th century um, or the long 17th century, something like that, starting, the, starting those periods of time before and, uh, and ending them after the time that um, people usually um, think of as the century. And that's what I really chose to do with the long year here. Now, but why would this be overlooked? Why would this year be overlooked commonly? And it's because most books, or in fact, all books other than mine that's been written about this period have been written from the viewpoint of the revolutionaries. By that, I mean, whether explicitly or implicitly, the authors adopt um, a narrative strategy which emphasizes what the leading revolutionaries are doing. They um, talk about um, what the, mostly the people in Boston are doing, but also other places. But what they do is they don't pay attention to the many, di to the dialogues that occurred in the year. They don't pay attention to the dissenters. But of course, because my dissertation was on loyalists, I came at this topic from the standpoint of loyalists, from the standpoint of people who dissented from the experiences of this, the, this period, from, the, um, from the dom what has been the dominant narrative of it. And, um, and it was my work on these people that made me realize that 1774 was the really crucial year that everybody had been overlooking. Because what I want to do is to say this. If we think about precisely the events of 1774, just think about it. In 1773, Americans almost to a person were loyal to King George III and the empire. Not even people like John and Samuel Adams differed in their loyalty to the empire. They gloried in their identity as British citizens or as subjects, not as citizens. They didn't call themselves subjects, but they call themselves British subjects. But by the end of the year, by late 1774 and early 1775, as I found in my work, first on my dissertation, and then actually much more in this book, that had all changed. By the end of 1774 and the first months of 1775, colonial governors wrote uniformly to Britain to say that the people would not obey them, that they regarded the resolutions adopted by the First Continental Congress in the fall of 1774 as their laws. And the governors reported to the ministry that it was best not even to try to force the Americans' obedience to what they wanted to do, because that would show their impotence, that they had to uh, forego trying to get Americans to agree to um, to obey them because they knew they wouldn't. And so therefore they would have, um, they, they would show up their powerlessness. 
And I discovered in that same period, um, in December of 1774 through February of 1775, that America, ordinary Americans also wrote large numbers of letters to their friends in Britain that same winter. And they all expressed the belief that there would be war in the spring. And there was. In other words, the conflict that started in April, what came as no surprise to anyone who was there, came as no surprise to anyone who had actually lived through the events of 1774. And so what I want to do in this book, or what I do do in the book, is to talk about the political discourse of the year 1774 and essentially how Americans changed their minds, or a lot of Americans changed their minds, not all by any means, but how Americans came to a new consensus about their relationship to the empire and um, how they should think about it. Um, I read newspapers. I read every political pamphlet published in America between October of 1773 and April of 1775, and many, and all of the broadsides also. So, I mean, I read all of those. Many of them, I might add, I read in person out at the, library, at, um, the Huntington Library in uh, San Marino, California, which was a wonderful experience. It's a great place to work. Any of you wants to, when the library is open again, it's a great place to do research, but it also turned out to be really eye-opening to me because I could see things like how many printings of different pamphlets there had been, because the Huntington has multiple copies of many of these pamphlets. And I could look at them together and I could see ones where, for example, typos had been changed, had been corrected by in, in future printing. So that was uh, something that I really enjoyed doing. And I looked at immense quantities of correspondence of people. Um, I found all kinds of correspondence in Britain and America in various um, collections where um, Americans had written to each other or to British friends. So what I wanted to do was to recapture the events of this long year of 1774 as they happened. So the book is organized chronologically. It's also organized geographically. When events in 1774 have previously been discussed in books, they have concentrated, the books have concentrated almost exclusively on Boston and Massachusetts, with perhaps of a bit of attention to Philadelphia and the First Continental Congress in the fall of 1774. But I made an effort to include all the colonies in my, um, in my study. And in fact, Georgia turned out to be particularly interesting. Alas, Florida is not in it because uh, Florida was Still not Spanish, but was still not deeply involved. Let's put it that way. But Georgia was especially interesting because Georgia, along with North Carol, along with New York City, had many dissenting voices. Many people in Georgia uh, dissented from the developing consensus um, uh, for war, for resistance, and in fact, Georgia did not send delegates to the First Continental Congress, or at least initially to the Second Continental Congress. So they, they kept out of the, uh, co the revolutionary coalition as it was developing. Now, although my book has plenty of action, including descriptions of large groups of men throwing tea overboard in various cities and towns, not just in Boston, this happened throughout the year elsewhere, or groups in late 1774 attacking forts in New England to take control of cannon, muskets, and ammunition, something that is rarely talked about in books about this period, Mine is really a book about talk. It's a book about Americans discussing with each other in print and correspondence what should be done as the crisis deepened and the year progressed. What I wanted to do in the book is to give voice to all the participants in the multi-faceted uh, dialogues of the year to show moderate and conservative positions as well as radical ones. Usually all you hear about in these books is radical positions. I wanted to show moderate and conservative positions regardless of where people ended up as loyalists or revolutionaries. And you can't always tell whether people are gonna support or oppose the revolution based on their positions in 1774. I, I run it in the book, I wanted readers to be able to forget that they know how the story came out and that they know how my book is going to end and to give immediacy to the discussion and to get have readers understand the kinds of dialogues that Americans were engaged in as they were thinking about what to do. And so there were many disagreements in the year 1774 and 
most of them are simply not discussed in most books on the coming of the revolution. So what I want to do tonight is to talk about several of those disagreements and to get you into the weeds, as it were, of how people talked about what, these, uh, what the problems they were that they were facing. So the first of these is what was the best way to oppose the tea being sent to North America by the East India Company? Now, the, the, the immediate precursor of that question is why did they want to oppose the sending of the tea to North America in the first place? We tend to think that it was because the, they wanted to oppose higher taxes. This is not true. What they were opposing was lower taxes. This might seem entirely counterintuitive, but it is absolutely correct. Um, the, what they were opposing, what Americans opposed in the Boston Tea Party and these other events was the symbolism of the tea tax. They did not oppose the amount of the tea tax. What they opposed was the ability of parliament to tax them. Um, you've all heard the phrase, no taxation without representation. What they meant by that was not what they wanted representation in parliament because they knew they would be outvoted. What they wanted was to be taxed only by their own legislative bodies. And so what they were opposed to was the, what the, was the Tea Act of 1773, which explicitly lowered the tax that Americans would pay on tea in their colonies in order to compete with smuggled tea. You see, the Americans were wonderful smugglers. They were prodigious tea drinkers, and they drank every year hundreds of thousands of pounds of smuggled tea. That tea was smuggled from the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch could have cared less that their tea was being smuggled into the British colonies and therefore not paying taxes. But what the, British, what the smuggled tea was doing was undercutting a legal British tea. And so, um, the idea behind the Tea Act of 1773, which was adopted by a parliament that included many uh, members who were stockholders in the East India Company, was to prevent the East India Company from going bankrupt because of the competition from smuggled, East, from smuggled tea from, uh, from the Dutch. It was always called Dutch tea, even though it didn't always come, didn't always come directly from the Netherlands. Now, there were very different ideas about how to oppose the tea um, that was coming to North America. Um, in October of 1773, Americans first learned that tea ships were coming, seven tea ships were coming to North America with the tea under the terms of the East India Company, under the terms of the Tea Act. Um, one of those ideas was to force the, the consignees, the men to whom the tea was being sent, to resign their positions. The argument was, well, if there's no one to officially receive the tea, then it can't be sold and we won't have to deal with it. So that was one argument. Another argument was to set up a consumer boycott of tea. It's okay if you let the tea land, we just won't buy it. We'll all agree, we'll all sign statements that we're not gonna buy tea. So that was a second argument. The third argument though, was to not let tea land in the first place. And that was originally promoted by Dr. Benjamin Rush of Philadelphia, who later became a leader of the revolution, but at this point was an anonymous essayist. He later on revealed that he'd written this essay, but he wrote an essay which he said, look, if we let the tea land, people are going to buy it. Even if they sign an agreement saying they're going to boycott it, they're going to buy this tea. And so therefore, they will, um, uh, we can't let it land in the first place. So that's what happened in some places. We know that in, there was destruction in Boston and later elsewhere was the most dramatic version of not letting the tea land, but there were other ways of not letting the tea land. One way was not to let the ships enter the harbors. That happened in both Philadelphia and New York City. Basically people prevented the tea ships. They, greet, they met the ships before they got to the, the ports that they were heading for. And um, shall we say persuaded the captains that it would be a really good idea not to let the tea land, not to let, not to enter the harbor. And um, so basically the captains in question were very smart. They knew this was the right thing to do. And so they didn't enter the harbors. And so the tea was never available for sale. Another possibility was to confiscate the tea, to let authorities, local authorities confiscate the tea. That's what happened in Charleston to the tea that was sent to Charleston, South Carolina local customs officials confiscated the tea and stored it 
and basically kept it under lock and key. It was eventually, years later, sold for the purposes of the revolution, but it was actually confiscated by British customs officials. It was also, this was also done with tea from what I think is one of the most interesting stories about all, from all of this period, which is the shipwreck. One of the teas, one of the seven ships, actually wrecked on Cape Cod. It was heading for Boston and it never made it. Um, and um, three of the tea chests that were, dis that were damaged in the wreck remained on Cape Cod while the rest of it was shipped up to the British headquarters in Boston. Those three, um, tea chests, the tea in those three tea chests was actually part of it destroyed on the Cape, but part of it was confiscated by locals and then part of it was actually sold. So it's the only tea that, the, that arrived in 1773 that was actually sold in North America was the tea that wrecked on Cape Cod. And one of the things I did in, um, in researching the book was actually to visit the site on Cape Cod where the ship wrecked. So that was really fun. It's now in the Cape Cod National Seashore. I thoroughly enjoyed that particular piece of research for the book. Now, of all of these methods, the consumer boycott had the most staying power. But it's very hard to assess its impact, as we know that many people continue to drink tea even if they did so in secret. We actually have memoirs of people who lived through the revolution who said, well, you know, we agreed not to drink tea, but my mother and I would light up the, <laughs> would light up the fire and, have, and drink tea in secret in the basement when no one was watching. Um, so there was, a, we know there were lots of um, essays in newspapers calling for the boycott of tea. Um, and it was, of course, not just the tea that was sent in 1773 that was an issue here. Because, of course, people had tea stored in their, in their larders. Um, stores had lots of tea on hand at the time all of this happened. And so there began to be public burnings of tea. People, for example, uh, Princeton students had a public tea burning. Um, where they threw what supposedly was all the tea they had stored in a, in a bonfire. Did they really do that? No one knows. Um, but they said that's what they were doing. Um, or in Lexington, Massachusetts, um, they had a tea burning and they invited people to, to come. In Charlestown, Massachusetts, they did the same. To get people to come to Charlestown, they actually served booze to the people who were watching the burning of the tea. So that was a big, a big draw. Um, but we just don't know what was happening. And furthermore, a lot of that tea had been smuggled. That was the reason for the Tea Act in the first place. So people, in fact, argued, well, why don't we just drink smuggled tea? It's not the East India Company tea. We can do that. But then other people said, wait a minute, we can't really know what the origins of the tea we're drinking are. So to make sure we're not drinking East India Company tea, we have to destroy all of it or boycott all of it. And um, one of the most interesting um, pieces of evidence I found in working on this um, book, and there really is pieces, it's at the Huntington Library, a group of slips of people asking for permission to drink tea. And it's directed to the local committee in a town in Connecticut. And the committee had control of the tea in the town. And people would write in and say, um, my, I'm sick and my doctor says I really have to have a half a pound of tea to help me get better. And uh, can I please have half a pound of tea? Or can I please, um, for my neighbor whose child is ill or whose elderly parent really needs tea, can we please have tea? So there's about 10 of these slips of paper that are in the Huntington Library. How they survived since 1774, I have no idea, but they are there and can be read. And I did quote them. I quote them at one point in the book. So people then argued um, too uh, that you should stop drinking tea because it was bad for your health. This was an argument that women found pretty stupid and said so in print. Uh, but there were doctors who said, who said to young women, whatever you do, don't drink tea. It will make you give birth to sickly children. Um, and they will, they will die martyrs to your, uh, to your addiction. Um, this didn't work very well. And so there were women who wrote back to the newspapers and said, wait a minute, why don't you just tell us 
there are political reasons not to drink tea and we will, we will not fall for these stupid arguments because after all, for years, everybody's been drinking tea and nobody thought it was bad for your health. And now suddenly it is, I mean, duh, are we dumb? You know, so I, I appreciated those women who said that sort of thing. So anyway, that's one whole set of arguments. How do we oppose the tea? Another set of arguments that nobody talks about is disputes over paying for the tea that was destroyed in Boston in December of 1773. I'll bet no one on this call, unless you've read the book, knew that there were disputes about whether Boston should pay for the tea or whether the tea should be paid for. But in fact, debates started throughout the colonies immediately after the news of the Boston Tea Party spread. I might add here a small footnote, the Boston Tea Party was not called that contemporaneously. It was not called that until 1826. My colleague, Larry Glickman, found that out in his own work on consumer boycotts um, in, in America. Um, <coughs> excuse me, it was always called the destruction of the tea or the tea destruction or something like that. Um, but in any event, as soon as the news spread um, in Boston itself and elsewhere, both before and after the colonies learned of the British response to the destruction of the tea. Now the British response to the tea destruction was the adoption of the Boston Port Act by Parliament in the spring of 1774. Parliament provided that the Port of Boston would be closed until the tea was paid for. Um, and the only traffic that would be allowed in and out of Boston would be local traffic in food and fuel. And the, and the um, the British did their best to, um, to enforce this and they made it very difficult for Bostonians actually to get stuff into, um, into the city. Um, at that time, Boston was completely surrounded by water, but the city of Boston was on Boston Neck. It's now all been filled in. So even though Boston now has a large, a large harbor, it's not what it was like in the 18th century. And most of the supplies that came to Boston came by water in the 1770s. And so um, the British um, really interdicted all trade by water and insisted that all trade had to come overland. Um, all food, fuel, everything. And this was made it actually very difficult for Boston until the British left in, um, in March of 1776. But in any event, they closed the port of Boston um, on the 1st of June, actually only giving the, the Bostonians only received notice of the act on the 15th of May. So they had only two weeks time to adjust to the closing of their port. Um, you can imagine that things were really frantic in Boston during those two weeks. Now, many people, <coughs> excuse me, during this period, either before or after the adoption of the Boston Port Act, lamented, the Bo lamented what the Bostonians had done. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, for example, he was representing the colony of Massachusetts in London at the time. When he heard the word, the news of the destruction of the tea in Boston, he wrote back to his uh, friends in Boston and saying, this is a really bad idea. You ought to compensate the East India Company for the loss of the tea. He did not change his mind, at least we don't know that he changed his mind, until September of 1774 when he finally wrote back and he said, well, I've changed my mind. But in fact, for, for weeks, he wrote to Boston saying, you should, compensate, um, you should compensate the East India Company for the tea. Um, Henry Lawrence, also in London, a South Carolina uh, planter, wrote and said, what happened in South Carolina was actually much better. That is the compensation by the, uh, by the customs officers in Charleston. So you avoided the destruction of the tea. And one of my favorite people to quote here is George Washington, because George Washington said, there's a famous quote from George Washington, after the Boston Port Act was, adopt, was adopted and became known in America, he wrote, the cause of Boston is now the cause of all America. That's fine, but what people usually do when they quote that, when they quote that is they leave out the parenthetical phrase he added at the end, which is not that we approve of the destruction of the tea. And so um, that's usually left out of what, bought, what in quoting, um, quoting Washington. Now, some groups maintain discrete silence about the destruction of the tea. For example, um, in the summer of 1774, Virginia counties, 28 Virginia counties, adopted resolutions on the current situation, the current political situation. Um, they were, it was easy for them to criticize uh, the British for what they were doing 
But what did they say about Boston? Well, of the 28 counties, only one county explicitly said, Bostonians, you were right to destroy the tea. Another county said, Bostonians, where you were wrong to destroy the tea. Three other counties said, Duh, we don't know enough to say whether you were right to destroy the tea. And everybody else, all the other counties, didn't even mention it. So I call that maintaining a discrete silence. It was just too hard for them. They, they, they did not want to seem to be opposing Boston, but they really did because they thought it was a bad idea. So what positions were taken on the issue of compensating the East India Company? Well, many, as I say, thought that East India Company should be compensated. Some even thought they should be uh, awarded shipping costs. In addition to the cost of destruction of the tea, they should be compensated for how much they had paid for the ships that brought the tea to North America. Um, but the issue was how would they be compensated? And this was the, uh, the rock, shall we say, on which all plans to compensate the East India Company shattered because some people said, well, they should be compensated by the perpetrators of the event. But the people who engaged in the Boston Tea Party were disguised and they kept their identities secret for 50 years. It wasn't until 50 years later that they started to say, well, actually, I was one of those people who destroyed the tea. And then by then, there were all kinds of people saying they had been one of them who really hadn't been. And so one historian has tried to figure out who really was there or was logically there or not. But they were impossible to identify. So how could you do that? So some people said, OK, Boston taxes should be used to pay for the tea, official Boston, or maybe Boston unofficially. And there were wealthy, wealthy citizens of Boston who offered to contribute to compensating the East India Company. Because once you compensated the East India Company, then the Boston Port Act was supposed to be lifted and, and trade could start again. So wealthy Bostonians said, okay, I, even though I had nothing to do with the destruction of the tea, I will help to compensate the company for it. Um, other people said, no, no, it's not Boston. It's all of Massachusetts should do it. Or all of colony, all of the colonies should chip in. Or in wealthy individuals throughout the colonies should chip in. Or one man, John Dickinson, who later became, of course, a leader of the revolution in Philadelphia in the summer of 1774 said, let's use payment for the tea. He didn't say how we were going to pay for it. Let's use payment for the tea as a bargaining chip with the ministry to win, the cha win a change of, um, of various um, laws that the British had been adopting um, to uh, coerce the colonies. Um, now, this issue was not decided until October of 1774, when the Continental Congress voted no, but we don't have any record of the debate on the matter. We have no way of knowing, except we know that it lasted about a day. There was a full day's debate on the, in the Continental Congress, but there is literally no record of what was said. All we know is that the Continental Congress at the end of the day voted no, we will not compensate the East India Company. And that was in effect the end of it. Although actually, even later, I've discovered Benjamin Franklin was still sort of negotiating, trying to use payment for the tea as a means of winning some kind of concessions from Great Britain. Now, a third disagreement was over the calling of a Continental Congress in the first place. This was more easily resolved. Boston did not want a Continental Congress. We never think of it this way. But Boston wanted the other colonies to join an immediate cessation of all commerce with Great Britain and the British West Indies to use economic, um, to use economic pressure um, to get the British to uh, change their policies, um, uh, to change the Ford Act. They, as they assumed that British merchants were very dependent on trade to America and that if they boycotted everything coming in from Britain, those merchants would then pressure Parliament to change the laws, and then that would that would work to their advantage. Um, it was the this is also a key later to the adoption of what became called the Continental Association, which is the main economic um, uh, coercion coercive measure that the Continental Congress tries to adopt. Um, so the the um, the Bostonians really wanted this immediate cessation of commerce, but other colonies instead called for a Continental Congress to discuss matters. Uh, Connecticut, uh, New York, and Pennsylvania in particular joined in saying, no, no, we can't do this right away. We have to talk about it first. 
only Maryland was the, was the colony that supported Boston in its, in its immediate call for a cessation of commerce. So in other words, the Continental Congress was the conservative alternative in 1774. The, and it was accepted and the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia in early September. The pamphlets that were written before the uh, uh, Continental Congress met saw it as a conciliatory body, or at least potentially so. Several, two very famous, quote, loyalist pamphlets, that is pamphlets written by loyalists that were published just before the meeting of the Continental Congress are actually quite positive about what they think will come out of the meeting of the Continental Congress. Of course, the Continental Congress did not meet those expectations. It went in another direction, but that's another story, a story that I tell in the book, but I don't have time to tell tonight. So these were general debates, but there's one other, uh, there were also heated arguments in individual colonies. And I wanna use one as a final example, because I think it's really um, a very interesting one. It comes from South Carolina. And the issue began at the South Carolina Provincial Congress in July of 1774, when after two days of debate, the members of the Provincial Congress voted that South Carolina would only be bound by resolutions that their own delegates had approved. At the First Continental Congress, the South Carolina delegates then used that club to insist that there had to be a special exemption for the exportation of rice, the colony's major crop, after the Continental Association's non-exportation agreement was to go into effect in September 1775. The non-exportation agreement was to be additional coercion um, if the, the non-importation agreement of the Continental Association didn't work. Now, the other Continental Congress delegates did not want to lose South Carolina. It was too important a colony, too, too wealthy. So they agreed to that. So when the Carolina delegates referred, re returned to Charleston, they probably expected plaudits for their action. But no, they were harshly criticized because the other colonies excoriated Carolinians for not being willing to sacrifice for the common good. And so, and all the other colonies had been willing to sacrifice their own e economic interests for the common good. South Carolina had not been willing to do so. So the delegates to the, from, from South Carolina barely avoided formal censure by their uh, provincial Congress after three full days of debate at the, in South Carolina. So after the adjournment though of the First Continental Congress in late October of 1774, which is really just over 246 years ago, it was, they adjourned in late October of 1774, the circumstances in the colonies spiraled completely out of British control. To repeat what I said at the outset, by late 1774 and early 1775, the governor's letters to the ministry express, express their helplessness and their inability to control the residents of their colonies. And this was totally underscored by letters um, from individual colonists to their friends in Britain. I wanna to close tonight before, before I answer questions with one of the epigrams that I use in the book, which shows this change of heart in late 1774. It's an essay from the, an anonymous essay from the Pennsylvania packet that's adopted in, that's published in November. I have no idea who wrote it. I just know it wasn't Thomas Paine because he wasn't in Philadelphia yet. So he couldn't have written it. I thought, oh, it's gotta be Thomas Paine, but it can't have been because he wasn't there yet. And here I quote, I almost wish to hear the triumphs of the Jubilee in the year 1874, to see the medals, pictures, fragments of writings, et cetera, that shall be displayed to revive the memory of the proceedings of the Congress in the year 1774, end quote. I just wanna repeat that first phrase again. I almost wish to live to hear the triumphs of the Jubilee in the year 1874. Now, every American historian knows about the centennial celebration in Philadelphia in 1876. This author was there. He was just there two years too early. It just shows, A, the importance of the year 1774, which is why I wrote about the book. But I wanna say that, that, what, that what that statement did was it implied independence. And people who read it at the time understood that. And they commented on it with that in mind. Um, the author did not write a promised follow-up, or if he did, he never revealed his authorship of this essay. And I really wish he had written another follow-up, but it was 
I found this statement so dramatic, it just leapt out at me from the page. And I have to say that other people have quoted that same essay and nobody else has ever quoted that particular sentence, which to me is the heart of the matter. So I will end with that tonight and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks so much, Professor Norton. And happily, we already have a question. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a little while for these things to start uh, coming in. The first question is, for you personally, what was the most surprising disruption to our conventional narratives of the American Revolution that you came across in your research? It goes on to say, thank you for your work on such an enlightening new book. Ah, uh, okay, the most, hmm, the most, uh, Repeat that again. I mean, the most, I'm trying to think of the most. Surprising disrupt. I mean, what did you. What was most surprising? Yeah, disruption to our conventional narrative. So. To our conventional narrative. Well, I think it was all those uh, Virginia counties that never said anything <laughs> about the destruction of the tea, while they nevertheless um, opposed British policy. I mean, they did not ever express an opinion. They deliberately eschewed expressing opinions on the destruction of the tea. And you know, we, attend, we, we tend to think that everybody out there said, hooray, Boston, but they didn't say that. And so I, 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 wouldn't, I would say I wasn't expecting everyone to say, um, hooray, Boston, but I was not expecting people to remain silent, utterly, utterly silent. Okay, next question starts with some compliments. My lecture, amazing, so. Kudos. Um, do you see parallels between the anti-tea disinformation dispersed among doctors in that era and the pervasive disinformation measures occurring across social media today? Well, of course, at that time, it was only newspapers, uh, although everybody did read them. I mean, there's no question, but they came out weekly. Um, so it always took a while to get uh, responses, whether uh, positive or negative. I, I didn't think of it in those terms, but yes, it is, it is tea disinformation. Um, but I have to say, as I said in my talk, women didn't seem to buy it. I mean, it was quite wonderful that doctors kept writing about how terrible tea was for women's health in particular. Oh, it was also bad for men too. I left that out. Um, one, of, one doctor said that it would make men become like women. They would become less masculine. Um, he claimed also that um, once tea was introduced into Europe, uh, Europeans' uh, health uh, uh, declined and Europeans' stature declined. That is, they became shorter when they started to drink tea. So uh, he, he foresaw similar uh, problems in America. So, um, but I like the fact that there were women out there who said, no, this is really just a stupid argument and just tell us we shouldn't drink tea for, for political reasons. <laughs> um, I'll jump in with a question of my own because it's a follow-up before I come to the next question. Um, uh, there was a great book a few years back about uh, reception of coffee and chocolate and so forth in 16th century, 17th century Spain and right. chocolate and, and coffee were very dangerous and all that. Right. Right. Was there any, ever that, I mean, did this tea, this, did these attacks on tea, did they come out, come from an earlier tradition along those lines of this strange new uh, substance? Well, not really, because of course, uh, Americans had been drinking tea for a long time. It wasn't a new substance. The problem was that the, was to try to get Americans from, from not drinking it, uh, to not drink something that they were very familiar with. I mean, I found all kinds of statements at the time that described Americans as prodigious tea drinkers. And um, one person has, one historian um, has figured out that Americans drank, you know, um, the equivalent of, I, I can't remember now, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, de the details, but she figured out how many pounds of tea each American would have had to consume to have reached the quantities that we think were consumed. Now, of course, since many of those quantities were smuggled, it's really people's estimates. But for example, um, I found a statement of uh, somebody coming and he was traveling in what's now Northern New York and he saw Mohawk Indians drinking tea. I mean, it was really a universal beverage um, that everybody drank for breakfast and sometimes throughout the day and that women drank 
when they were socializing in the late afternoons. And I have, I'll have a funny story along these lines to tell you it's from John Adams. In the summer of 1774, John Adams was riding the circuit. Um, he was up in Maine and he had been in the saddle for something like 30 miles. And he got to a, um, an inn, the inn where he was staying in Falmouth, Maine, now Portland. And he asked the innkeeper, can I have some tea that has been honestly smuggled? <laughs> and she replied, I'm sorry, we are not allowed to serve tea in our town, but I will serve you coffee. So he took the coffee instead. And we know about this from a letter that he wrote to his wife, Abigail, several days later, because he then added, and I have ever since been drinking coffee and I have borne it very well. That's his way. <laughs> So um, some people have thought, in fact, that this is when coffee drinking first entered America, but th that's not true. And I know that because of the work of a man whose who's, um, help I acknowledge in my, uh, in my acknowledgments, a man named James Fickner, who teaches at the University of Hong Kong, who is doing a major book on the tea trade in this period. And he has discovered that, in fact, Americans went right back to drinking tea, smuggled, of course, um, after the war started and after the political reason for boycotting tea was off because you weren't buying it from the East India Company anymore, you were buying it from the Dutch. Thanks. So the next one, uh, again, with a, starts with a compliment. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Such a great retelling of this story. My question, I'm curious about what enslaved communities and or Native American communities thought about or commented on the political events of the long 1774. Very good question. And in fact, I looked for responses and I didn't find any. Um, it was something I looked for and did not locate. You do have, um, there are, um, okay, there are very occasional comments um, in Georgia about fears of the of the um, residents of Georgia about the Creek Indians and how they might respond to um, a, a um, division between the Georgia settlers or the Georgia residents and Britain. Um, and so there were, in fact, that's one of the reasons why the Georgians did not send people to the First Continental Congress, it's because they feared that um, if they joined in any kind of formal resistance to Britain, that the Creek Indians might take advantage of that. But I didn't find anything that the Creek Indians themselves said. And um, likewise, in New England, uh, I found nothing whatsoever about um, uh, African Americans, uh, enslaved people, um, and their attitudes toward what was going on uh, in 1774. I might add, it's very different later. Once the war starts, the, the whole situation completely changes. But in 1774, they're just not participants in this discourse that I was studying. The, um, I did find one, um, one New England minister who said, who was trying to explain why New England was being afflicted by the British. And he said, it is because we hold slaves. And he went on at some length about that, um, that he thought that New Englanders, if they wanted to be free from the affliction by Britain, um, which was imposed ultimately by God, because that's what the New, New Englander, that's what the New England minister said, that the British were afflicting the Americans, but they were doing it basically because God allowed them to, or because God directed them to. Um, and he said that one of the reasons was that New Englanders held slaves. I might add that another one said that it's because we're too addicted to tea. <laughs> so you got those different answers. At, by the very end of the period that I'm studying, that is by, by, the, by the late winter of 1775, uh, by 70, 74, 75, there do begin to be sort of rumors about, um, about enslaved people joining forces potentially against, um, against white residents, against their owners, but they're only very scattered and very much rumored. And I never found very much, um, I only found like one account of each of them. It was impossible to, to verify any of it. But that's a great question. I wish I had a better answer. But if you want to know, I mean, what happened after the war started, take a look at Rob Par Robert Parkinson's book, um, The Common Cause, which really shows how things changed dramatically after the war started from what I found in 1774. 
Thanks. And I could have wrapped the, the, the next question in with that one uh, because it says, uh, could you talk about the silences you came across in the yeah, arts right. and what you did to move forward? So I guess I'll amend it to say, can you talk about other silences? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm, one, one of the silences was very much about the role of women and about gender. With what, except for the tea, except for the attempts to get women not to drink tea, um, there is silence about the role of women, which I found um, telling and which I found, um, well, I, I have a speculation about it. Um, the, in previous um, resistance to Britain, that is, it, the whole idea of a tea boycott, let me back up and say, if you're boycotting tea, women are the ones who are deeply involved not only drinking it, but because they were the ones who were shopping and they were the ones who went to the stores. And if you wanted people not to drink tea, you had to convince women not to buy the tea in the first place. And back in the 1760s, when the whole argument about tea started, it was a different sort of argument, but it was also an argument about tea taxes. Um, there was an attempt to enlist women as well as men in a boycott of tea. It didn't work very well. I mean, people did sign up and say, yes, we won't buy these things, but in fact, they did. And, but, and men worked hard in the late 1760s to involve women explicitly. In 1774, except for trying to get women to stop drinking tea, they didn't really try to involve them in the resistance. Um, so it's quite different. And I speculate in the book that basically the men realized that they couldn't, I don't really put it in these terms, but I think of it as this, this way, that the men realized they couldn't control the women. And so they basically um, kept it all men. They kept the decision-making in men's hands. They did not circulate those statements to the wider population to get them to sign statements that say, yes, we won't, we won't drink or buy tea. Um, instead, they set up these committees composed completely of men who then did, uh, took coercive measures against local people, um, mostly men. Um, and so they kept it very much a masculine enterprise. Um, and I think it's because of that they were dissatisfied with what they had done in the late 1760s, although I don't talk about that at all in the book, but that's just the, the conclusion that I came to as I was working on it. Thanks. Um... Next question is, uh, in the lecture, you spoke about people who broke expectations by violating boycotts in private. Mm -hmm. Do the dissenters slow the revolution at all, or was it their rule, uh, or sorry, or was their rule breaking relatively non-impactful? And I guess I'll add, was there any tea drinking <laughs> as a, a, you know, public tea drinking as a way of showing loyalty to the British? There was public tea drinking as a way of showing oil to the British. Yes, that was, that was done by certain people. It was certainly done in occupied Boston by the, by the British troops and by people there because the other Bostonians could do it. But yes, it was, there, there are recorded instances of people doing public, public tea drinking. Um, there's also instances of people, there are, there are, I tell a story in the book of one, one family getting um, attacked because it is said they d drank tea publicly when actually they didn't. Um, but there was actually one wonderful case that a guy recorded in his diary that he went to have tea, at, he went to drink tea at somebody else's house and the person assured him that it was local tea, that it was, that it was called um, Malagany something. And, but it turned out to be actually imported green tea. Um, so it was, it was being presented as something that was not imported tea, but it was. So there is that that goes on, this sort of secretive stuff. Um, but in addition, um, yeah, uh, there are people who, there are actual, and I do talk about this in the book, um, in early 1775, there are um, defense associations that begin in New England of people who are actually bearing arms to try to oppose what's going on. Um, they all collapse. They don't, they don't, um, they're not able to continue, but there is formal armed opposition to the developing revolution by um, December 74, early 75. Thanks. 
Uh, next question, I suspect, comes from a tea drinker. Does <laughs> drink the tea with lemon or milk? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Probably not lemon because lemon was very expensive. I mean, it was hard to get lemons. There's no refrigeration. So um, it, lemons were a real treat, um, probably with milk. Um, but I can say that there were whole varieties of tea. Um, the tea that most people drank was called bohia tea, which is basically a, a black tea. But then there were fancier varieties of green tea and other, and actually lapsang souchong, which is a smoky tea no, still drunk today. Um, some of them, I have no idea what they were. Uh, I don't know what the names refer to, like singlo. If anybody knows what singlo tea was, I'd be interested in knowing. But lapsang souchong is still today known and um and green tea of course is still today known and um and that was known as hyson tea and it was more valuable than the black tea so i suspect people didn't put any milk in green tea i don't i don't know anyone today who drinks green tea with milk in it hey thanks um the next one is uh about the boston tea destruction as i now know to call it right uh, Surely the uh, loyalists and administrators and the British understood that Indians had not dumped the tea in Boston. Were the disguises simply to cover themselves up or was there a greater social commentary? The disguises were simply to cover themselves up, but there was some social commentary involved because um, there was a tradition of people who were doing disruptive things dressing themselves up as Indians. Um, it wasn't just the tea party or the destruction, it was other, other times. And Phil Deloria has a very interesting book about that called Playing Indian. And it's about the tradition of people sort of dressing up as white people, dressing up as native people uh, when they're doing something destructive. So um, the, the people in Boston um, did something that was pretty common um, for people who were doing disruptive things. Thanks. Um, next question uh, says, I was wondering whether you could talk more about the changing discourses in the private correspondence you mentioned between colonists and recipients in England. Does the private discourse imitate the language of widespread political publications like pamphlets? Mm -hmm. have, more, have a more emotional element that we really see in the more politically centered uh, histories of the American Revolution? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, yes, um, the, it is more emotional. The, um, the private correspondence tends to be much more, well, much more personal as one would expect. Um, people either writing from either side, writing from England, I, I read letters from England of Americans and letters of Americans to England, to both Americans and Brits. Um, and um, yeah, it is much more emotional. For example, let me just give you one example that comes immediately to mind. Um, I didn't talk specifically about the details of the coercive acts, but one of them was known as the Administration of Justice Act. That's the former formal name of it. And the Administration of Justice Act in, in a nutshell provided that any British official or, um, or, um, or, or, or military man who was accused of killing a colonist could be tried in England rather than in America. The colonists immediately dubbed that the Murder Act. And I was really struck by that. And they wrote to their friends about their horror at the Murder Act. And one of the men who did that was someone who ended up as a loyalist. So that just tells you something about the reactions and the, the murder act, the phrase, the murder act, to my knowledge, did not appear in print. It only appeared in private correspondence. Um, and the, of course, the correspondence I read was very much um, from individuals who were good friends, who expected their friends to agree with them, usually. And so, um, that was, uh, and uh, I read a lot of correspondence actually from, um, from future loyalists um, talking about what was happening um, in the colonies. Um, so they were not happy about what was going on for the most part and they let that be known. Um, none of them wrote pamphlets. So I can't really talk about the, the specifics of someone whose correspondence I read, whose pamphlets I also read. So, but the pamphlet literature was, of course, much more formal and so forth. Yeah. 
but that's a great question. And thanks, and we'll take time for, uh, uh, I think, one last question. Um, uh, sorry, I, <laughs> <laughs> it got switched around with a couple of new things coming in. Um, if the colonists knew they were going to drink tea, despite them being outwardly anti-tea, and they knew they were outnumbered in Parliament, would it be fair to say that they politicized tea drinking in order to establish their own government and or to provoke the revolution? Oh, no, I don't think so. They just like to drink tea. I mean, they were, <laughs> they were tea addicts. What can I say? I mean, it was like, it's like coffee addicts today. No, I, I don't think any of that was very deliberate. I think they just, they wanted, um, they wanted their tea and they were prepared to mostly smuggle it. I mean, I, I wish, I wish you could find out more about smuggling. There have been books and people, you know, there, there is a book about smuggling. Um, there are people who've worked on smugglers. Um, I would say the closest I came to it was I went to visit the island of St. Eustatius in the Caribbean, which was the Dutch island that a lot of this tea passed through. And it's now known as Stacia. It is a tiny island. It's in the far northeastern Caribbean. It's um, very well located for ships coming from Europe and ships coming from North America. Um, it's very obscure now. It's never going to be a, a, a place where anybody vacations because it only has very tiny beaches and they're black sand and um, they don't have any water particularly so they can't have a golf course. Um, but it's a really interesting historical place to visit. And um, I, it was one of the and I, I went to it long before I planned to write this book, just because I'd heard so much about all the smuggling that went through St. Eustatius. And I thought, there has to be this giant harbor. Well, there isn't. <laughs> anyway, I have an illustration in the book from the 18th century of St. Eustatius, looking, which shows all the ships there. Not in the harbor, but only in a roadstead sheltered by two extinct volcanoes. Um, which which sheltered the uh, anchorage from um, from the prevailing winds. Well, great! Thank you so much for this great talk, uh, and uh, I'd like also to thank the audience for showing up. Uh, and uh, hope you'll come back for more talks. And um, uh, hope you all have a great rest of the evening and a great weekend. Uh, so thanks again for joining us. Thank you.